Well, good morning, everyone. Russ Barkley back again with your weekend research review. Sorry, I'm a little late this morning. I was off doing some things with my grandson. Uh, so I hope all is forgiven. So, but let's start out with your dad joke. Okay. So here's your dad joke for the morning. Why is it so cheap to throw a party at a haunted house? Because the ghosts bring the booze. I knew you'd like that. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Took a little while for your reaction, but it's pretty good. Okay, everybody, let's move on to our first study that we want to talk about. We're going to talk about five of them this morning. First one was published over in Pediatric Research. It's a study that comes out of China, and it's examining patients with ADHD and looking at the risk for traumatic brain injury in comparison to their unaffected siblings. That's a very important comparison. We have known for a long time that compared to the typical population, kids and adults with ADHD carry a higher risk of TBI, traumatic brain injury. Uh, but this is one of the few studies that's actually compared them to their siblings. So, and what did they find? Well, let's take a look down here. This is a Nice study because it involves over 18,000 patients with ADHD, more than 18,000 of their siblings, and a control group of nearly 200,000 in the population. So very big study, very nicely powered. Uh, findings probably going to be very robust. What did they find? As before, with many, many earlier studies, those with ADHD had a higher risk for TBI. How high was the risk? Nearly 1.6 times higher. So over one and a half times greater than was seen in the control group. But here's the interesting finding. The siblings also had a higher risk for TBI, not quite as high as the ADHD patients, about 1.2 times higher compared to 1.57 times higher to put a fine point on it, but still higher than the typical control group. So it looks like both those with ADHD and their siblings have higher than normal risks for TBI, the risk being higher in those with ADHD. Now, why would that be the case? Well, the genetics of ADHD are such that we would expect the siblings to also have ADHD, perhaps undiagnosed. And even if it's not at a level of clinical ADHD, they're still more likely to have some symptoms of ADHD than the general population because ADHD creates a family phenotype of symptoms, even if only some of the members have enough symptoms to get a diagnosis. Now, what was also interesting about this study is that the likelihood of being hospitalized following a TBI was greater in the siblings than in those with ADHD. Not quite sure how to explain that, just suggesting that it's a more ser serious injury. So even though their risk is a little lower than their ADHD siblings, the likelihood that it's severe enough to lead to hospitalization is greater. So that's worth contemplating, I think. But overall, a very nice study out of China, as I said, published over there in Pediatric research. All right, next up is a treatment study. Uh, you might think, why am I talking about this one? Uh, we've had a lot of evidence about the effects of atomoxetine hydrochloride, called Stratera here in the United States, and its effectiveness in helping kids and adults with ADHD, nearly as effective as methylphenidate, one of the stimulants. So, you know, that's not the interesting part of this study. What is interesting is that this study out of China, which was published in the Journal of Clinical and Nursing Research, found, or excuse me, compared a group of people who took atomoxetine alone versus a group of children who took atomoxetine and their parents got a psychoeducational counseling and behavior modification therapy along with the children getting the medication. Now, we've seen in earlier studies with stimulants that combining a psychosocial treatment like parent training with medication often leads to better results than you get with medication alone. By better, I mean, first of all, the families find the treatment much more acceptable than just giving them a prescription. 
Second, we also find that parental knowledge of ADHD goes up. So that's very important as well. And then we typically find that even some of the behaviors of ADHD are improved by the parents learning better ways of parenting, of child management skills. And guess what? This study found virtually the same thing. Comparing the 30 kids who got medication only to the 30 kids who got medication and the parents got behavior modification, the behavior modification group, that is the combined therapy group, did better on a variety of measures. So uh, again, very consistent with what we see with other meds. This is the first time I've seen this with atomoxetine, however. Now, I do want to point out one caveat here. There was no control for the parents getting attention for attending therapy. In other words, that would be like a placebo effect. We know that when people come in and get professional attention, they often report better results than people who didn't get that kind of professional attention. So it's not necessarily what the professional is telling them to do as much as simply spending time with the professional. So to control for that, there really should have been a third group here that met with professionals but didn't get the active behavior modification recommendations, maybe just got information about ADHD instead. But that said, pretty good study, nice results. Again, once, once again, showing that combined therapy is better than medication alone, even though medication can be quite effective by itself. It's always good to add some counseling and behavior modification for these families. All right, up next, another treatment study. This one over in the journal Neuroscience and Biobehavioral Reviews. This is a study out of the United Kingdom, and it's a meta-analysis comparing individuals who got stimulants and individuals who got atomoxetine again versus placebos on cognitive measures, neuropsychological measures of attention, inhibition, reaction time, and working memory. And what did this meta-analysis, this review find? And by the way, they did find lots of studies out there. There were at least seven on atomoxetine and over 20 on methylphenidate that had collected these kinds of measures. And what this meta-analysis showed is that both medications, the stimulant and the non-stimulant were found to improve performance on these neuropsychological tests. And there was virtually no difference between them. The only exception was that atomoxetine did not seem to help with working memory as much as the stimulant did. Whereas methylphenidate was found to affect all of the measures positively. But that said, on all the other measures, the drugs were essentially equivalent and were superior to the placebo. So very nice meta-analysis uh, out of England. All right, next study up, number four, is also a treatment study. This published over in the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. This one comes to us out of the Netherlands, and it's using very large databases to look at the issue of does adhering to your medication consistently versus not adhering to medication reduce the risk of committing minor criminal offenses in teens with ADHD? So we've seen before a couple of studies that suggested that people who take medication are less likely to engage in criminal behavior, among other things, than are people off their medication. This study looks at those, everybody was given medication, but it looked at, did you adhere to it? Or were you erratic, inconsistent, and maybe had even stopped your medication? And the study found, as you can imagine, that the high medication adherence group was associated with a significantly reduced risk of committing minor offenses during the next three months or the next six months and a reduction of about 33 to 38% compared to their control groups who weren't taking medication when they were on medication. So a very nice reduction there in criminal behavior. Now, 
Can we attribute this to the medication or might there have been some other explanation for it? Well, the authors of the study also looked at adhering to SSRIs, serotonergic drugs, whether you adhered or not. And they found that there were no differences there in criminal offending. So uh, what this suggests is that it probably was specifically the ADHD medication that was leading to this reduction in crime, but we can't say for sure because it's still possible that people with a higher risk of engaging in crime are also the ones less likely to take their medication. So it might not have been a medication at all, but it looks like it might be. Remember, this is a correlational study. And as I always say, you can't interpret causes from correlations. But given some of the comparisons that were done here with the other types of medication, the SSRIs, looks like it might well have been the ADHD medicines that led to this. But very interesting study there. Finally, we're going to wrap it up this weekend with our last study, also a treatment study. This is looking at the short and long-term outcomes of medication adherence in adolescence. So looking basically at the same question, but instead of focusing only on criminal offending, this looked at a variety of different outcomes and compared teens who stayed on their medication for a longer period of time versus teens who took the medication and then discontinued or failed to adhere. And they were, uh, were looking at a variety of studies that made these comparisons. So it's a review, like a meta-analysis. And what they found is that there were at least six studies that had made these comparisons. And each study found that medication non-adherence was associated with a increase in a wide range of adverse outcomes, including decreased academic performance, heightened familial stress, greater personal psychological distress, and an increased likelihood of substance use, of pregnancy, of being obese, and of suffering injuries, accidental injuries specifically. So this being a much broader review, also again showing that ADHD medications when they're adhered to, appear to result in improvements in a variety of domains of risk. So, okay, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this week's roundup of research. There were many other studies. Again, I put all the studies in the description that goes with the video, and then I also give you the specific links over to the studies that I talked about here. So uh, thanks again, and we will see you another weekend with another research review and later during the week with another commentary. And as always, thanks for subscribing to this channel and for being a listener to these videos. And also, thanks for recommending this channel to others. It's doing quite well. Uh, we're hoping to cross the 100,000 subscriber mark sometime in the next few weeks. Boy, that'll be a great milestone for the fact that this channel has only been up not quite a year as of this date. So thanks everybody for making it such a success. Take care and be well.